All right, guys. So I guess this is like a continuation, part two, I guess. Um, the first stream I did um, a while ago, so long ago. I mean, it was so two hours ago. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> well, maybe an hour ago. Anyways, um, that was just showing the prep work, you know, just how I prep the coat by going through and combing everything out before the bath. And now you see it's all nice and clean. But um, and I was actually going to start the stream when I actually start the haircut. But then I was thinking about how important this part is because um, what I'm doing is I'm combing the hair in the direction I wanted to stand. You know, it's called training the hair. Just like if I wanted to, I can create, I can train my hair to part in a certain way by just combing it that way over and over again repeatedly. Then you kind of train that hair to lay that way. Same thing with the Bijans. Because I want the head to be nice and round and fluffy, right? Like a big snowball. I want the hair to stand up. So I'm gonna comb up. And I felt like this was a little tip that might be important. So I was like, maybe I should just go ahead and start streaming now while I'm preparing the hair for the haircut. <clears throat> so before I was preparing the hair for the bath, I was really preparing the skin for the bath, to be honest, to be, that's more accurate. And the shampoo actually is made for the skin rather than the hair. Um, it does it does help the hair, of course, but the reason why you wanted to let it sit is for it to actually be able to get in that skin and help the skin. So everything is with the skin in mind, but now I'm preparing the hair for the haircut. Before I was preparing the skin for the bath, now I'm preparing this hair for the haircut by combing it in the direction that I wanted to. And you can see here, even though we got all that dead hair out before the bath, I'm still getting more of it. Because, I mean, dogs have trillions, trillions of hair all over their body. And a lot of them are damaged and old and, you know, dead, disconnected at the root. But they're still inside the pores, hanging out in there because it grows in a unit. So anyways, what I'm doing is just combing all of that dead hair out. But as I'm combing it, I'm also training the hair to lay in the direction that I want it to stand so that I can do a nice haircut, but also after the haircut, it, it'll hold its shape for a while, right? So you don't have a flat head, you know, it just deflates. It's like, what in the world? Was it a helium balloon, you know? <laughs> after a few days, it starts to <laughs> deflate. It's, it doesn't uh, float anymore. So we don't want that helium effect. <laughs> we want it to hold its shape for a while. And so she has a nice round snowball head. Alrighty, and before um, I was when I used to learn about the breed and really research them, I guess in the 80s and the, and even in the 90s, kind of the way that uh, they were typically uh, groomed was the head was bell shaped. <laughs> so instead of a round head like this, it would be more of a bell, you know, and the ears would stick out and then it would go in. So the head looked more like a bell before, and that was what was acceptable. But now, um, the, you know, with times, everything's changing. And now the trend is the more round head, that little snowball head. So in order to get that, though, we're going to have to comb all the hair in the direction that I want it to lay. So you can comb it down, but then you want to comb it back the way you want it to actually lay. So when you do the haircut, it already has pretty much the, the shape to it. And you just gotta kind of trim everything nice and smooth. There we go, so then comb back up. There we go. Because I remember I was, when I was newer, I was working at a groom shop one time and I was combing this hair down like I do with most dogs with the ears. <laughs> and um, I hear, June, June, they're like yelling at me. <clears throat> and I look up, I'm like, yeah, what's going on? They're like, comb up. I was like, what? They're like, comb up. And I was like, oh, like this? <laughs> but yeah, but at the tips here, the tips of the ear, I do like to comb out to get all that out and then go up again to let it stand up straight. So there we go. So now that I've got the hair all combed this way, that was just the head though. Now I gotta comb the rest of the body. And I like to start with the head when I'm combing after the bath because you know I want the head 
to hold its shape as well as, as good as possible because most owners, when they look at their dogs after being groomed, this is what they're gonna look at, is the head. The head and the feet. So it, usually, as long as you get the head really nice and the feet looking nice, you're usually good to go. Now I'm gonna comb the rest of the body and the same thing applies. I'm going to comb in the direction that I want the hair to lay. That way, when I do the haircut, I'm gonna reinforce those directions, cut in those directions, constantly reinforcing those lines so it trains the hair to lay those ways. So when she stands up, she looks like a statue. Everything works together and it doesn't look like, you know, something just pops out of nowhere. Okay. Oh, doll baby. What's up, doll baby? Hey, doll baby. Weren't you the one that told me about the table risers? I got them. The six inch table risers. Thank you so much, doll baby. If that was you, maybe I'm giving credit to the wrong person, but I think it was you, right, doll baby? Um, incredible. Oh my goodness. I really like these risers. Makes a world of difference. You know what I'm saying? Like being an Asian guy, I didn't think six inches mattered. <laughs> but yeah. Six inches, wow, what a difference. <laughs> All you need is six inches, oh man. And you change somebody's world. <laughs> anyways, anyways, the stereotype is not true by the way, you know what I'm saying? Asian guys, we're not all, you know, lacking in, in, the, in certain areas, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, I know that I'm a little, I'm a little larger than most Asian guys. You know, I'm bigger in stature. I wear a size 12 shoe. You know what I'm saying? You do the math. <laughs> you do the math. Size 12, I wear a size 12, you know? So that means that I have big feet, right? Big feet means that you wear big shoes, right? Big feet means you got big hands. You know what I'm saying? And usually the appendages. <laughs> Anyways, why do we get on that topic? Oh yeah, six inches, that's why. Anyways, oh hey. How am I going to get out of this? Um, let's see here. So uh, what I'm doing is I'm combing here, <laughs> right? And just combing. And see, I'm combing down, not up, because I'm, like here, the legs, I don't really mind if they, if they, you know, lay down like this. Because most of the times, even if I do fluff it up like that, which I will when I get a haircut, when she moves around and walks around, the legs usually lay anyway, so I'm, I don't really mind. So, and like I put in the title of this, this is not a show trim. This is a pet Bichon, and she, you know, she goes outside, she gets to play around, she lays around on the couch, you know, she rolls around with the other dogs. She is a pet. So even though I'm gonna honor the breed standard, I'm going to tweak it a little bit, alter it, you know, tailor it to, to be more practical to fit her needs, right? The lifestyle of this dog. So, there we go. Come on that up. So what I'm doing here is the angles that I want here are like this. So we're going in this way and in this way, 45 degree, like making a V in the chest. And then here I am gonna comb up because I want the hair to stand right there we go and then the legs and then here i usually go down this way and you can right 45 degree angles diagonally down the ribs down the body and then stand the hair back up there we go all this before the haircut <laughs> so you know, I, it, me, it, me too, when I started grooming, when I, when I first decided that I wanted to be a dog groomer, I was like thinking about the haircuts and I was really stressed about the scissors and how am I gonna do the haircut and everything. I had no idea how much work was involved before you ever put scissors on the dog. You know, by the time you get the scissors out, everything else should be done so that you don't have to put the scissors back down and start working, you know. Like once you get the scissors out, you're about to finish the haircut. And once the haircut is done, you should be able to just put the dog down, you know, put the dog, set the dog on the floor, <laughs> off the table. Shoot, not put the dog down, you know. Anyways, man, I'm on a roll tonight. 
today you're going here Alrighty. and man her coat feels so soft oh my goodness so fluffy i love it you get this tail so after um i dried her i let her out to, uh, to use a you know go potty and i also took a break and had a little snack i gave them some treats and took her sister and her brother out so they can go potty so now that everyone's comfortable, we're gonna go ahead and finish the haircut. Look at all this, isn't that amazing? That's even after the bath. That's after all the combing and brushing I did before the bath even. So here we go. Okay, now we'll just do this leg. There we go. And the thing I see, what I'm doing is I'm combing this way here, right? So the angles go like this, this way, right? And then from here, I'm going back, right? So the angle like that way, that way, and then back down. I'm doing that on this side as well. And that way, even if she's just standing still, she looks like she's, you know, her body is just flowing. You know, it looks like she's moving effortlessly because it, we highlight the natural structure, the angles of the bone structure of the dog. So it just looks like she's, you know, built perfectly. Everything looks in balance. There we go. Look at that. Oh man. All right, look at that. Oh my goodness, it feels so nice. And see that little balls of fuzzy dead hair popping out? Right. Oh wow, I see comments coming in. Okay. Uh pretty dog. Nice. Uh doll baby. While I totally agree with using the risers, I can't take credit. Oh, okay, shoot, it wasn't he wasn't doll baby. Uh Sue says, thanks for being honest. Why wow, she's so honest? I I personally would have taken it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I would have taken that compliment. I don't care. I go around stealing compliments all day long, especially from dogs. You know what I'm saying? I, I see the compliment coming towards them, I just ah, I eat it. Anyways. Um, Sue says, that was me about the risers. You was killing me watching you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, Sue, you were the one. Oh, thank you so much, Sue. Oh, my goodness. But, yeah, oh, these risers. Like, seriously, like, I don't have to bend down, you know. I don't have to strain my back and knees. I love this. So, thank you so much. Um, now, yesterday, like, when I put a great pair of knees on my table, I didn't need the risers, of course. So, for the bigger dogs, I don't need it. But yeah, for these little ones, these risers, oh my goodness, it makes a world of difference, you know what I'm saying? So, I really appreciate that. And I don't even think I was, a, I, I commented and thanked the person, you know, Sue, I never even commented on it, but I read it. <laughs> so I want you guys to know that, like, even if I don't get a chance to reply, I do read them. And, you know, even if they're critical comments, I always take it in consideration and... You know, if there's suggestions, I always consider that. So just know. I know um, like Joe Rogan and people, Seth Godin says, like, don't read the comments. Don't read your reviews. You know, don't read them. For me, I think they're so helpful, though. You know, and Seth Godin says, don't read your uh, reviews if you, if you publish a book. But for me, I feel like it really helps to read the reviews, especially if it's something that somebody's suggesting, suggesting that I can improve on. Because uh, even if they did say it to be mean, if it helps me with my next book, you know, and I, I take what they say and I take that constructive criticism or feedback and I, I use it and improve my writing style for the next book, you know, I, I feel like it's a win-win, right? So I personally do enjoy the engagement and I enjoy the, in, in, you know, interaction and reading the comments. I, I used to love being able to just sit down and reply to everybody. But, you know, now I am. Okay, so before I was thinking, I can't reply to everyone, so I'm not going to reply to anyone. But now I am thinking a little bit different. And whenever I get a chance and I see the comment come in and I'm, I actually can reply to that person, I do now, just at that moment, just real quick. 
And I don't allow myself to feel guilty about all the other comments that I didn't get to, because I just figure I'll get to them when I can, and if I can't, I can't. You know, but when I can, then let me get at least answer someone and you know, not avoid answering anyone just because I can't answer everyone, you know? So now I'm just kind of, you know, trying not to be so rigid, you know, like I try not to, you know, do the whole like generalize like all or nothing, you know, always or never, you know, like, nah, it's just sometimes does exist. Sometimes I reply, most times I don't, but I'm not gonna be so like, all or nothing anymore you know everyone gets replied to or no one gets replied to you know i think that's a little extreme um marathon says most importantly where did you get those clorox wipes i can't find any <laughs> nice right oh shoot oh man the, so that actually is here um, it's my client's clorox wipes i have been using some though uh, doll baby, just do the best you can. Exactly. Right, doll baby? I think that's what it is. Just do the best I can. And I think most people give me the benefit of the doubt. And I think uh, I got this I that idea from Seth Godin. He was saying that if you just continue to show up consistently and you just con and you continue to do the best you can, you know, you really try, people will see that. And he's saying it takes time. Over time, you build that trust with your audience and they give you the benefit of the doubt when you mess up and I really I, I that kind of made me feel a lot better like maybe I have gained enough trust with enough of my audience where you know they will give me the benefit of the doubt now I actually need to get another number one comb because check this out it, it dropped and then this thing popped off and now this I can't get it back because that spring I tried lifting it and everything I just can't so I think I just get, need to get another um, one comb, which is a half comb uh, comb guard, but it still does work because when I put it in, it does, you know, I'm gonna pull it out anyways. So for now, I'll see it does work, right? But I think next time I go to um, pick up my shears, cause I have um, scissors that I have to pick up at my friend Josh's place, Clipper Pros up in Buford. So when I go up and pick up my clippers, or I mean my scissors, I think I'm gonna get another one guard just because you know, it's not a good look, right? So anyways, so oh, before I used to uh, use a two comb, which is shorter than this, which is about a quarter inch. So this is a half an inch. The other comb is a quarter inch shorter, right? I used to cut her really short because she was a little bit overweight and big and it kind of gave her a slim look, but she has lost a lot of weight. They put her on a diet healthily. They, they did it the right way. They put her on a diet, limited treats, and now she's nice and not overweight anymore. She's not obese, you know, like me. You know, I, I think when I took the body fat index, um, it said I was morbidly obese. <laughs> I am morbidly obese, but that's okay. I don't care, uh, but she's not anymore uh, is my point. And so I'm gonna go through with the one comb a little bit longer than we usually do because now she's a little thinner. Okay, um, Dolby, I return because you are real. I like you for who you are. Oh, thank you. Wow, I really appreciate that, doll baby. Okay, so I'm gonna ask her to stand. Thank you so much, girl. Make sure she's comfortable. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is just get my fancy comb here. See, it was on the um, fine side and I flipped it like that to get it on the core side because unless you know how to flip the, sh flip the comb like that, you know what I'm saying, you're not really a professional. I almost dropped it. <laughs> so anyways, but again, that's just my style. You don't have to be like me. Every artist is different. You know, some artists are a little flashier than others, right? So it's all good, right? It's all good. Here we go. So we get all the hair to stand up. There we go. Awesome. Awesome. Good girl. And then you lick their nose. You want to lick their nose. Put your tongue on their nose so they really taste and smell your scent, which you're all about, right? Anyways, that is a must. I usually don't tell people what to do. You know, I tell people 
live your own life, do your own thing, be unique, right? But that is something that's a must. You can't skip that step. You have to literally lick their nose right on their... <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. That was not cool. Why did I say all that? Anyways, let me see here if I can get this at a better angle so you can see what I'm doing. Because you're going to want to see this. It's freaking magical. It's freaking incredible. I don't know if you'll ever see witness anything else more incredible in your entire lives. I don't care how long you live. You know what I'm saying? Even if your lifespan is thousand years i don't even care you're not going to see anything more incredible than what you're about to witness right now so you have tuned into the right place you have stumbled into the right stream right <laughs> some people are probably like no you really haven't i've seen his streams before you're not missing anything hey don't come back then you know what i'm saying anyways <laughs> so you want to do everything with the end goal in mind, right? So because I'm going to scissor her all nice and round, and I want this to be stay nice and full, so I have this to work with and scissor it so she doesn't look like a Q-tip, right? Like a big head just comes out of nowhere. I want to keep this full. So instead of clipping from there, what I'm going to do is clip from here where the shoulder is and avoid this whole back section and just come here. So I'll show you. So I'm going to come in here on the shoulders. And remember those angles I told you about? Oh, sorry about that. My cord's all tangled up. Oh, my goodness. Where's my assistant producers? Shoot. All right. Next time that happens, you're going to have to find yourself another, another star. You know what I'm saying? Shoot. Treat the talent this way. Give me a clipper with <laughs> tangled up cords, you know what I'm saying? I can't work like this. I'm not, this, not professional. All right, Nikki, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for raising my voice like that. You know, sometimes you just got to let them know, you know? You got to let them know who they're, who they're playing with. So anyways, <laughs> the same angles that I combed her, I'm going through with the clippers, right? This way. To make that kind of V shape, angle it right in to the chest. And then on the front end, I do like to go reverse right here where the neck is, just to give it a really nice compact look, nice and tight in the front. And that way, when the front is nice and tight and the back is nice and tight, you get a nice compact look where the dog doesn't look too long. All right. So see how that belt is all long right there? I just completely avoided this area because I'm just gonna scissor that. I'm going to use scissors to trim that down and blend it. So now I'm coming through this way. I have to lift this, lift this leg up. So now for a breed standard, like if you were going to show, trim a show uh, Bichon, you wouldn't want to do that. You wouldn't want to trim right there. You want to leave that full. The reason why I did that is because she's a pet groom and she's a pet Bichon. And so when she goes outside and runs around and everything, having this area nice and clean and short is gonna prevent matting, so that's why. So even though that's not really like show standard, you know, if this is a modified pet trim, a modified Bichon trim for a pet Bichon. So now I'm gonna go straight back. Look at that, like butter. And that's because of all the combing we did. If I didn't do all the combing at the beginning and right before I started uh, clipping, the clippers would catch, make clipper lines, it would not be smooth like this. So the reason for all of that brushing and combing is so that when you finally come to do the haircut, it actually cuts smoothly and you get a nice finish. So now I'm going to lift this back leg up. I'm going to do like that. And then on the underside, I like to go reverse. Again, because when you go against the grain, it makes it nice and short, shorter. So then you have a really nice clean line on the bottom here. See that? See that? Nice clean line there now. And here as well, if it's show Bichon, 
I wouldn't really trim here. I would scissor that. But again, because it's a pet, um, I'm, I'm doing things that are more for function more than fashion. It's function over fashion when we're doing pet trims. That way the haircut looks nice and it is fashionable. And you know, you want them to look cute, but for pet trims, especially when you're not gonna groom the dog for another four weeks, four or five weeks, you know, you're gonna go a month before you give them another haircut or anything. You want it to last, you want it to be functional. So that, you know, if I gave her a show trim <laughs> and it's all nice and full everywhere, I probably would be walking into a nightmare the next time I come because it'll be all be matted up and everything. Because, you know, those show dogs um, require a lot of maintenance in between the haircuts. They're always getting combed and brushed daily, you know, several times a day actually. So, you know, it takes a lot to maintain that show cut, that show trim. And most pet dogs, it's just not practical. So that's why I like to um, clarify, you know, make that distinction. She's a pet Bichon and we're giving her a pet trim, not a show trim. So let me come on this side here. Oh man, I'll show you my incredibly sexy body. You know what I'm saying? Wouldn't be nice if you could touch my body. I wish everybody want to touch my body like me. Anyways, no, that was not that song. That's not how it goes. Anyways, <laughs> how it go that's how it goes in my head. Okay, so <clears throat> Charles T. June. Hi, June. Just popping in to say hi. Hope you're well. We'll watch back later. Wow. Oh, that's not Charlie. That's Chelsea. What's up, Chelsea T? Okay, so now, oh, you know what? Just to show you the difference, this is a nice opportunity to give you a little before and after. So see, it's not much of a difference. I'm not taking much off, but you can still tell a little bit of a difference, right? Like you can see the line right here. This side is definitely a little bit longer than this side. And if I get her to stand, you can see it even better. See, this side has a nice little line and angle to it, and this side doesn't. It's a little more fluffy and, you know, chunky. See that? So that's the difference. See, so we're not taking a lot of hair off. You know, grooming is not about seeing how much hair you can whack off and seeing how fast you can do it. You know what I'm saying? It's like I can shear her down right to her skin in 20 minutes flat. You know, it's like, wow, you're an amazing groomer. No, grooming is not about how much hair you can possibly take off and how quickly you can do it. That's, for me, that's not grooming. You know, for me, it's knowing what to take off and why, you know? And even if you're just taking off just a little bit that most people won't even tell the difference, it's still that little, it's all in the details, right? That little bit kind of plays a, in like an optical illusion on the eyes and makes the eyes see something that wasn't there before, you know? And to me, that's grooming, that's art. So knowing where to cut and why to cut, why you're cutting there, that's more important than knowing how to cut a lot of hair. <laughs> All right, so now, same thing. We're gonna come through here. Oh, you know what? Whenever you hear your um, clippers making, making a little bit louder noise than before, Probably time for, to oil them and here's what you're supposed to do is take it off and oil but little trick while it's running just put it right there on the blades on the contact point right there on the inside contact point there we go and I just let it run a little bit All right and then I wipe off the excess oil right and even though there is a little bit of oil there now under the teeth, not it doesn't really, there's not a lot of transfer onto the coat. All right, so, so here we go. See that? <clears throat> I don't see any oil on that coat. So very minimal transfer, if any, of the oil from the clippers to the coat. As long as you let it run a little bit, run it through and then wipe it down. So there we go. See that? Avoiding this, this part here, this ridge, if you will, 
on the back of the neck. And I'll leave that all the way back here to where the shoulder blades are. I'm not gonna touch it because I'm gonna use that to blend into the body, into the big head. And I'm gonna, the only way to do that um, properly is with scissors. These clippers are really just to get all the hair, all, you know, pretty much the same length quickly. But in order to get a nice haircut and a nice shape, you have to have scissor skills. You have, it, I feel like there's no way to get a dog to look good, you know? I mean, depending on which dog, but if you're working on a Bichon or Toy Poodle, you know, any dog with long hair, Shizus, if you don't use scissors to, you know, shape everything up and like if all you do is use clippers, I mean, I'm sure it might be possible and more power to you if you can, I respect that. But for me, I find it nearly impossible to get a nice haircut without finishing with the scissors. I feel like that's, you know, there's no secret, there's no, you know, substitute, there's no way around it. You have to have good scissor control and you have to be able to execute, you know, with the scissors well in order to get a nice good haircut. So sometimes when I actually catch myself kind of going OCD with the clippers and I keep combing back and keep going back down and back over it because I see lines, I remind myself sometimes like you're going to go back over it with the scissors, right? It's like, oh yeah. <laughs> It's like that's kind of why you do. You, that's why kind of why you go back over the whole thing with scissors. It's to smooth it out, right? Like, oh yeah. Well, then why am I wasting so much time <laughs> going over and over it with the clippers when I know the clippers aren't really going to give me a very, you know, the the really finished, nice, smooth cut, you know? So sometimes I have to have little, um, you know, arguments with myself, you know, little meetings with the boss, you know, because I'm the boss. And so I have to talk, I have to have meetings with myself sometimes. But yeah, I, I, I literally have conversations with myself sometimes like, hey, why are you spending so much time doing that? And it's like, uh, because it's not looking smooth. It's like, but aren't you going to go back over it with scissors to smooth it out? Oh, yeah. Well, then why don't you pick up your scissors and put those clippers down? It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, that's right. There we go. Okay, so now that we got all the hair about a half an inch now, so that. And now on the front, I'm gonna go against the grain just like I did on the other side. Just like math, just like a math equation, which I'm not really good at, but I hear what you do on one side of the equal you know, equation, you have to do it on the other side. Same thing, it's about balance and symmetry. If I went reverse on this side, I gotta do it on this side as well. So it's about balance and symmetry. You want the dog to look balanced. You want all of the parts, all of the body parts, the neck, the shoulders, the chest, the arms, I mean the legs, you want it all to flow together nicely. You know, so that it looks like one harmonious um, work of art. That's why I really think that grooming is art because you're you're piecing together the you know the different pieces of the dog, the puzzle, different pieces of the puzzle. You know, I kind of equate it to an orchestra or a symphony. You know, like when you sit down and listen to a symphony and you and you watch the orchestra playing, there's so many different parts. You know, there's the strings, there's the percussion, there's the flutes. You know, the brass, the woodwinds. But they're all working together to make one harmonious uh, sound, right? Melody. And, you know, sometimes the percussions or, you know, one, one section will be louder than the other, but that's always on purpose. So even with the dogs, I don't want any section to be too loud, you know, and stick out. But the head might be a little louder than the rest because, you know, it's on purpose. We want the nice round beach on head. Okay, um, Shan I am says, need to have my dog watch this because she needs to nearly be sedated before her grooming appointment. Wow, which is tomorrow, but she doesn't know that yet. 
beautiful little dog. Oh, Shan, I am. So I, I've actually groomed several dogs like that, and they've had become my regulars, and they no longer act that way. And what I would suggest, Shan, I am, is find a groomer that you really trust and like, and you kind of vibe with. You kind of feel like you could be friends with that groomer, and keep taking your dog to that same groomer, because for dogs. It's all about the relationship. It's all about the rapport I have with her. This was Bill's over four years. She wasn't like this. I used to have her on a grooming arm and a grooming loop. Now she I, she just lays on the table for me because she trusts me. But we it took years, right, to build that friendship, that trust between us. So now I can even touch her feet here. She, she still doesn't like it too much, but you know, I'm, I'm into feet. What are you gonna do? Anyways, <laughs> but Shen I am, I would suggest finding one groomer that you really like and keep taking your dog to that same groomer. That way, it's kind of like after I built trust with her and she knows and likes me and she, you know, and then I, I train somebody else, I say, hey, you should go, you take over. And somebody new comes in, even though they have the same uniform as I do, they, they, have, they hold the same title as I do, they're a groomer, I'm a groomer, it's still different. She doesn't know me. I mean, she doesn't know that other groomer like that that other grandma would have to build their own unique relationship with her. And that takes time. So Shen I am, it may be because every time she goes, she gets groomed by somebody different and she's never feeling like, like somebody that she trusts is the one grooming her. For example, if my, da if my daughters were taking a bath and well, now my older daughter's 12, it would be inappropriate. <laughs> but when they were younger, let's say when my daughters were four, or three or four years old, and they're taking a bath. If my wife or I went in there and we helped, you know, wash their hair and things like that, it's fine because mommy and daddy. What if one of my friends went in there with great intentions, with pure intentions, and started washing our hair and washing my daughters in the in the bathtub? I don't care what his intentions are. He's no longer my friend, and he probably will no longer be breathing. You know, <laughs> I would end his life. Um, <laughs> so there is like, I feel like this is washing your kids, right? And so for me, when I first started washing her, she's like, who are you? Why are you touching me? You know, but as I kept coming as consistent, I, it, I earned and gained her trust. Now I'm, now I'm the creepy. <laughs> no, that, okay. Scrap that analogy. That analogy does not work. Okay. <laughs> Cause either way, <laughs> either way it's weird. Okay. What? Okay. How about this? How about if I was out with my daughters at the playground, right? And <laughs> sorry about that horrible analogy, analogy, analogy. Anyways, uh, what if I was out with my daughters, right? And I, I run my fingers through her hair, right? I'm like, you're just so beautiful. And then another guy comes, someone we don't know, and does the same thing. Oh, you are so beautiful. I slap his head. Stop that. You know, what, are you, <laughs> what are you doing? You don't know her. <coughs> I think same thing with our dogs, you know. We kind of take it for granted. We just kind of assume that all dogs are just supposed to allow anybody to touch them. And they're not. They're like kids. They're children. Yeah, they have to know you first. Okay. Uh, uh, Claire says, hi, June. I've not caught a live in ages because I'm in Scotland. You can... And in Scotland, what time is it right now? It's got to be nighttime sometime, right? Uh, okay, it's because I asked enough times. So it would be uh, 4 o'clock. It's 4 p.m. over there in Scotland, right? About 4 or 5 p.m.? Anyways, Claire. <laughs> uh, Shannon M says, thank you so much. I found a wonderful person and been with her for a few months. Will continue to go perfect. My multi poo has footsie issues too. Uh huh. Nice to know progress can be made. Exactly right, Shen I am. And that's why when somebody um, calls me and they're like, "Hey, I'm looking for a new groomer," I ask them like, "What's what's wrong with the groomer you're going to?" You know, like keep going to the same groomer. Um, they built, they earned your dog's trust. That's important. Um, Claire says, thanks. I'm finishing up and cleaning my tools. Thanks. This is making it go quicker. Nice. You make me laugh. Stop talking. <laughs> 6 p.m. Okay, I was off. I was off a little bit. But isn't that awesome? Is, are you not impressed, Claire? Are you not impressed that I remembered that? Holy crap. Anyways, I don't even know what time it is in South Korea. Okay. So, now that we got the body all trimmed up with the one comb that I'm going to replace because that spring thing 
is bothering me. So now I usually would do the legs with the C comb and this is seven eighths of an inch or 22 millimeters. I only looked at it to double check, but I already knew that. I knew it, I didn't have to double check, but I did anyways, just so I give accurate information. But I don't want you to think that I was looking at it because I don't actually know, because I was just making sure, you know what I'm saying? It's locked in there, I want you to know. Anyways, instead of doing that, I'm gonna go a little bit shorter because, I mean, no. You know what? Uh, never mind. I, I forgot. I go in a little bit longer on the body, so I'm gonna go longer on the legs. But I used to do a two comb and then a C comb. No, I used to do a two comb and the A comb on her. I used to do two comb on the body and an A comb, which is three quarters of an inch on the legs. Okay, now I'm getting right. Now, don't do drugs, kids. Anyways, that's what it was. That's what I had in my mind. Sorry about that, guys. Alrighty. Partied so hard in my younger years. I'm paying for it in my older years. Seeing all kinds of crazy stuff. Anyways, Claire says, very impressed. Oh, nice. Awesome, Claire. See, that's what I do. I live to impress. Okay. So, here we go. I'm going to do the legs now. Can I ask you to stand, girl? Nikki, can you stand for me? Thank you. Also, okay, let me do that. There we go. All right. So now the legs. I'm gonna go with the grain in the front. So the front of the legs will be um, a little bit longer than the back of the legs. So with the grain here on the front and the sides. And then in the back of the legs and the inside of the thighs, I'm gonna go against the grain, giving it a little bit shorter cut. And let me show you here. Let me move the camera so you see it. There we go. Oh, sorry, that was the power cord. There we go. Okay, so, oh, there we go. Now you can really see it. So now, see that? As you, if you go reverse, it does give you a little bit shorter cut than if you go with the grain. And see that? That gives you already the natural little curve right there. And then with the scissors, I'm going to scissor in that round angle. You know, round it out. And then on the inside. There we go. Same thing on the other side. On this side, on the inside and the, and the back of the legs, I'm gonna go against the grain. There we go. And you can go back and forth, because the idea is to get it as short as possible. So, you know, you don't have to just go against the grain. You can go back and forth because you want that short, short cut right there. But then on the front of the leg, we're going to go again, I mean, go with the grain. And that way, on the front of the leg, it will be a little bit longer than the back of the leg. And let me explain why that's important. There we go. It's about balance and symmetry, again. And you're going to hear that in the grooming world, it's, it's a mantra, balance and symmetry, balance and symmetry. So you want everything to be symmetrical and balanced. What you do on one side, you want to match it on the other side, like a mirror. So, okay, so let me explain. When I have, uh, just like in the front, I went against the grain on the chest, right? So on this side here, I went against the grain. And so now here in the back, it's gonna be nice and, and tight, right? And then on the front here, it's nice and tight, right? So what happens is, when you look at the dog and she's outside, here looks nice and compact and tight. 
here looks nice and compact and tight. It's a little fuller here in the back, right? Because we went short here and we left the back long. We went short here, we left this long. So now she looks, instead of long, she looks nice and compact and balanced, right? And the front leg doesn't look like it's up here, right? Because this is short and this is long. And the back leg, this is short and this is long. So it looks balanced, right? That's why it's important. The little details, it's the little details that make all the difference. Okay. And Claire says, very impressed. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> that, was, that was about the timeline. Anyway, the time zone. Okay. Because I'm ready, baby. I'm ready to head over to Scotland. See, there we go. So we're going to go against the grain here. I mean, we're going to go with the grain here. And then on the front of the legs, go against the grain. All right, and that way the front of the legs and the side are gonna be shorter. And then you can even let the leg down and do like that. All right. Get that nice and short. And then only on the back here, I'm gonna go with the grain. There we go. See that? So now, when you look at it, the back is a little bit longer than the front, but you can't even tell. And when you look at her, she looks nice and balanced and symmetrical. And again, you see little sticky outies and everything like that. Don't OCD about that just yet because I'm gonna get you know scissors, and then with the scissors, we're gonna smooth everything out. So, um, and then you wanna flip your shears like that. Anyways, so. Now same thing on this other leg, go against the grain, the front, and you can go back and forth, like back, because again, the, the idea is to get it nice and short, as short as possible. Okay, and then in the back of the legs, we're just going to go with the grain. that <clears throat> so even though this isn't a show trim you know this may not be a show trim but it's definitely a show stopper a show show stopper <laughs> <I'm scared. laughs> no but even though it's not a show trim for pet Bijan this is pretty nice right it's pretty impressive and we modified the Bijan show trim to fit the practical needs of a pet Bijan right so this groom is functional more than it is fashionable, but it is still nice and fashionable too, right? So now you see this big head, we're gonna use the scissors now to do the rest of the groom. And because I've already filed her nails, cleaned her ears, everything is done. Now all I gotta do is just scissor and she's finished. So let's do that. <clears throat> Let me get my scissors out. Probably should have thought of this before. Uh, Claire says, my, my dinner's ready, so I'll catch up with you later. Looking good, June. And dog oh, thank you. Thank you, Claire. Have an awesome dinner. Alrighty. Do you cook, Claire? Do you cook your own dinner? Oh, never mind. She said she's leaving. <laughs> it's like, before you go. But anyways. Yeah, probably. Oh, bye, Claire. Probably best she doesn't answer that because... I'm also an incredible chef, and so whatever she can cook, I can cook better. Anything Claire can cook, I can cook better. Anything Claire can do, I can do too. Anyways, so <laughs> good thing Claire is not here to hear that little jingle. Okay, a jingle that I came up with, by the way, that was an original tune I just thought up of. So anyways, I'm sure you've never you have ever heard that melody before in your life. Now, to do the haircut. So, if you look at her, she's already very nicely shaped, right? She's already got a really nice shape to her. All I gotta do now is just kind of not mess it up. So, I like to thinners, right? 
and start with the thinners. And I like to start right here in between the eyes. Now with the Bijan, you wanna leave all of this here because that Bijan visor, right? The Bijan look. So we wanna manipulate this here, this all this hair in the, between the um, eyes that I usually trim off for most dogs. So what I'm gonna do is just in, in front of the eyes, right here where the nose is. So I'm gonna comb that hair up. All right, and then there we go. See that? All right there, just in front of the eyes. Because I'm gonna use the rest of the hair to shape it. So even though it seems like there's a lot of hair there, I'm gonna I'm gonna use all that hair. See that? So now you can actually see the eye. See that? You can see that eye. <clears throat> but I'm not getting rid of the hair that I'm gonna need to scissor right here in the middle. So right just in front of the eye. And you can flip it this way, or you can flip it this way, just whichever way is more comfortable. <sighs> there we go. from the eye so we can see those big black beautiful eyes see that beautiful I can see that eye now okay and look at that so not that much but it's not about trimming a lot of hair so it's about trimming the hair that's supposed to be trimmed and knowing why that hair is supposed to go all righty um Sue says June can twirl his tool so good because he was head majorette in high school <laughs> So I don't appreciate you putting all my private history out there, my personal life. Um, but anyways, it's all good though. I'll let it, I'll let it go because you told me about the six inch risers, you know, the table risers. So I will definitely let that go. You earned you earned one, you know, you earned one one <laughs> one get out of jail free. Bam! Look at that. Okay, so. Sometimes I do feel like a cowboy or something, you know, because when the hair gets stuck like that, you blow it and then you flip it. <laughs> it's like, it's like, bam, bam. <laughs> Anyways, so there we go. I'm having too much fun. I should not be having this much fun because I actually do expect to get paid for this. And I see if I had too much fun and got paid for it as well. So if you earn money, you're supposed to do it grudgingly, right? Drudgingly. <laughs> <laughs> work is supposed to be dreary, right? Work is supposed to be something that you just put up with and tolerate. And then you get your paycheck. And then you take that paycheck and you get to do something that you like and have some fun. You know, and that's your reward for tolerating the work that you hate to do. Tolerating putting up with the people that you really don't like, you know. And your reward for not murdering anybody in your office. And not going absolutely insane sitting there in an office cubicle you know or whatever work it is that you hate to do your reward for doing that is you get a little paycheck you know enough to help you do some things to forget how much you hate your job you know and then you go back after the weekend on monday and do it all over again so that you can maybe you know, do something else on the weekend that helps you forget how much you hate your freaking job. That's what I thought life was about. That's what I thought working was until I found dog grooming. I'm like, for the, for the longest time, I used to apologize actually for having to get paid for this. I'm like, oh my God, I'm sorry I have to charge for this. And my clients, they were just like, why would you apologize for doing a good job? I'm like, I'm not apologizing for doing a good job. I'm apologizing because I really enjoy doing this. I kind of feel guilty for taking payment for it. They're like, this one guy explained to me, he told me, June, but he's like, you're the only guy I know that can get away with that shit. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, you just cursed. You know, that's not professional. Um, but I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, oh, nobody I know can get away with that shit. He was like, the only reason why I'm letting you get away with it is because I he goes, you know, if I didn't know you and I didn't really know, you know, your, how you are, he was like, that wouldn't fly and I wouldn't be back. And I was like, oh, whoa, why? And here's how he explained it to me. He said, I, he said, you just robbed me 
of all the joy of paying for a, a you know a really good service. He was like, I love my dog so much that I'm willing to bring her here to you, and because I I believe that you give you know the best service around, and I want that for her. And he was like, and I I like paying for the quality service. He was like, for you apologize. He was like, you just robbed me of all my joy. You know, and I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't even think of it that way. He was like, when you apologize like that and people don't really know you well enough to know why you're apologizing, he was like, they might take it as if you didn't really do a good job or you're hiding something, you know? He was like, never apologize for taking payment for work that you did if, if, you, did, if you did a good job. And that really helped. That really, so I don't apologize anymore. You know, now I say, give me that money. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyways, you know, but it's not about the money. I take the money, of course. Shoot. If you're going to dang money in front of me, of course, I will take it. I take the money. But for me, it was never about the money. You know, for me, it was about, oh, my goodness, can I actually live like this? Can I actually wake up every day doing something I actually love? that I absolutely love and I, I you know, and I, I get to have fun with dogs and people love the haircuts that I do and, you know, they value me and like, I can actually enjoy the work that I do. You know, like it was just a new concept to me. For me, work was just something you, you, you did, you know, because everybody works, you know, we all have to work, right? Everybody has to do, everybody has to have a job, you know? So I just, I was like, all right, you know, so working at the car dealerships, even though I don't really like cars, you know, I was never really into cars or fascinated by cars or anything. For me, it's just a tool that I use to get from one place to another. But I really did like people. I do love people and care about people. And I wanted to help people not get ripped off at the dealership. And I know how nervous people get when they go to the dealership and they don't want to do the whole back and forth haggling and the whole games that they play. So I wanted to be the guy that helped people but I never really did care about cars. So I didn't really enjoy my job and I would call in sick a lot because I really did feel sick. You know, going, the thought of going to work made me feel sick. So that's just kind of how my, I believe that was my philosophy. That was like my paradigm. And then when I had that, finally had that paradigm shift, I realized, oh my God, I can actually enjoy the work that I do people actually like that more <laughs> you know the fact that they i love what i do so much i would actually do it for free but you know people like that and they they want to pay me they enjoy paying me you know like like he said i took the joy from him you know like i robbed him of the joy of paying me for the service and i was like oh, man you know i finally get it it took a while because i'm i'm so hard-headed you know, thick headed, but finally got through, finally got through. Maybe that's why he cursed, you know, to get my attention. Cause you know, if he didn't curse like that, he said to you and you're the only one I know that can get away with that shit. <laughs> it really did grab my attention. I was like, Oh, what? Get away with what shit? <laughs> okay. So now I combed it all up like that. I got the front here kind of scissored in, but I'm going to go ahead and do the finishing touches and everything and, and really make it nice as I finish rounding the head. But right now I got the shape so far started, right? That's what I like to do. Um, oh, June Wayne. I like that. Shout out him, June Wayne. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, and you get to Tanner. Yeah, Sue, exactly. Shan I am says, I'm not even a dog groomer and I'm very entertained. Oh, nice. I'm one of those sad sacks that sit in a cubicle so to be fair it doesn't take much but this is fun to watch oh thank you shannon and i'm sorry and the thing is i'm not talking bad about you that i was telling explaining that that's what i did i sat in a cubicle and called companies all day long and i hated it um and says hi there he is so cute i know <laughs> aren't i so cute oh my goodness look at this anyways and she's pretty too she's all right you know Anyways, so what I'm going to do now is because I have all of this surface area to cover, 
um, I'm going to use bigger shears just to kind of help create that shape faster. <clears throat> now, a little tip that I learned from Runes by Janine, um, these shears um, have been getting a lot of complaints, especially by sharpeners. And this one sharpener was saying, guys, please stop buying shears that are painted, right? See, it's painted black. He's saying the paint, um, dull, like it doesn't, anyways, I guess having the paint coated on the shears um, it affects the cut, doesn't cut well, kind of sometimes folds the hair and, um, you know, it's just been causing a lot of problems. And so I really haven't experienced that myself just because I'm an incredible uh, shear expert and I never have problems with my <laughs> as I was saying. Um, but from what I hear, and I never considered it, painted shears are not that great. So anyways, lesson learned. So what I'm going to do is... See, when I look at her, I want to look, I want to see the, her nose and make the nose the center of the circle. And I want to make a nice little circle around her head. So what I'm going to do is just go through and trim everything that sticks out of that nice little circle that I am visualizing. So you have to be able to see it in your head. You have to be able to imagine it, see it in your mind's eye before you actually start trimming. And that way, as long as you can see it in your mind and you can believe, you believe yourself, you have the confidence because you have the experience, you know, you see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hand. So that's what we do. We just go around. And trim it down to where the other hair is, you know, how short the hair is on the shoulders and the back, so that we blend it in. And sometimes they're going to move <laughs> and turn their head in a certain angle, and then you got a lopsided head. That's okay. You know, you just kind of <laughs> keep whittling down and fix the lopsidedness. I remember one time I got so OCD with this poodle top knot. I kept whittling away, whittling away until she pretty much had no top knot. <laughs> you get carried away sometimes because you're like, oh no, this part is sticking out. And then you whittle this side down. You're like, oh no, now I got to match that side and this side. And then you whittle this side down and then you whittle down the top to match that. And then before you know it, <laughs> you have no head anymore, you know? So there we go. But here's the thing though, speaking about jobs and your line of work what you do there's a a parable no actually i think it's a true story that became popularized by this baptist minister back in the 60s what was his name oh, what was his name was it joseph campbell i forget but anyways um you can look it up on google it's called acres of diamonds is the story acres of diamonds <clears throat> and the story goes that there was a farmer in South Africa, and this farm has been handed down to him. He inherited his family's farm, but he was kind of a dreamer, and he always went to sleep sort of unhappy, dissatisfied, because he would read stories about all these people traveling around the world, finding diamond mines, you know, finding diamonds and becoming rich. And so he wanted to go off on his own. And, you know, go for adventure and find diamonds. And, you know, he's like, I want to do that. So what he ended up doing was he sold his farm, um, you know, pretty much just gave it away because he just felt like it, it was holding him back. It was such a, such a burden to him, you know, his family farm. So he sold the farm for, you know, for a reasonable price, but, you know, not nearly what it was worth <clears throat> just to get out of there just to be free of the burden so you can travel and go look for diamonds go look go and search for treasure right um but what happened was after a while he started to run out of resources and money and he never found any diamonds he kept just traveling around aimlessly and one day he found himself on a ship and in in a moment of utter despair he threw himself over and drowned. Now, at the same time, the farm that he sold 
the gentleman who purchased it, he was walking the farm, really studying it, trying to get to know his land that he just purchased, you know, and as he was surveying his, his land in the creek, he saw something shining, like a rainbow color, you know, he saw something sparkle, caught his attention. He thought to himself, that's not, that's not normal. And so he goes and picks it up, and sure enough, it's a raw diamond, you know? And he's like, oh my God. So he has it inspected by a professional, and they let him know, yes, this is a very, you know, precious diamond. It's, it's very valuable. And they asked, you know, where did you find it? And he said, oh, in my creek bed. So they said, oh, you know what? There might be more. Let's go check. And so they started to... Um, you know, investigate and really started to dig in the land and, you know, look around. And it turns out the gentleman was sitting on the largest diamond mine, the largest diamond field in South America or South Africa. And he was overnight, instantly, the richest man in South, well, one of the richest men in South Africa because he's sitting on a field, acres, acres of diamonds. Right? And that's what the story is called. If you Google it, Acres of Diamonds. <clears throat> Here's the moral of the story, though. Each one of us, all of us, right now at this moment, we're standing in the middle of our own field of diamonds. Each one of us has been given land when we were born. What is your land? Your land is whatever task is given to you. That's your land. My land is this, grooming my client's dogs here in Atlanta, being a house call groomer and serving my clients to the best of my ability here in Atlanta. This is my land. Now, if I, if I were to be tempted to go off to Hollywood, you know, in search of treasure, fame, because I see other groomers making a big name for themselves. And I, you know, I feel like, oh man, look at that, that would be fun. You know, and I want to go and do what they're doing. I, I'm pretty sure I might end up dejected and depressed. And like the gentleman who sold his farm and went off in search of his treasures, you know, he ended up lonely, miserable, depressed, and sad and died. I'm pretty sure that might happen to me too. Because, you know, I left my land that was given to me. These people here in Atlanta, they trust me. I've earned their trust. They've given me their, their dogs. They trust me enough. They've given me their dogs to groom, to take care of, you know, to, to help them with their hygiene, keep them healthy. This is my land. And in, so the gentleman, instead of going off in search of treasure somewhere else and trying to be like everyone else or, you know, trying to be like others, if he would have just taken more interest in his own land, in his own farm, if he would have just studied a little more about what raw di what diamonds look like in their raw form, he would have he wouldn't have to go off in search of diamonds anywhere else. He was sitting on the largest diamond field in South America. So the point is, you don't have to go to Boston, you don't have to go to Hollywood, you don't have to go to New York City, you don't have to go anywhere. Wherever you find yourself now, that is your land that has been given to you. Work your land to the best of your ability, and that will give you fulfillment. <coughs> so there's a story about a pastor. He's <coughs> riding his horse and carriage in the countryside, and he's passing by several farms. And, you know, you see in one farm, you see them all, right? They're just farm and orchards and, you know, plants. <clears throat> but this one farm he was riding by, I mean, it just looked spectacular, remarkable. The, the way the trees were all lined up, the way the landscaping was so beautifully done. Everything about the land and everything about this farm was just so spectacular, breathtakingly beautiful. And so it caused the, the preacher, the, the pastor, to stop, <laughs> especially when he saw the farmer, you know, riding up. And he stopped and he called out to the farmer, 
My good man, God certainly has blessed you with a beautiful farm, hasn't he? And the farmer thinks about that for a second. He, he just, you know, takes it in for a second. He thinks about it for a moment. He says, you know, I suppose you're right. God did bless me with a beautiful farm, and I am grateful. But you should have seen this place when he had it all to himself. <laughs> you know, so it doesn't matter what the land looks like when you get it. Anybody, everybody has the ability to transform and work the land that we've been given, no matter how shitty it may look when we first get it. We have the ability in us to work hard and transform that land, turn it into something beautiful with the work of our own two hands. In that way, when somebody gives you a compliment and says, wow, look at everything you have, how lucky you are. God certainly has blessed you, hasn't he? You can look at them and say, you know, you're right. I suppose you're right. God really did bless me. And I'm grateful. But you should have seen, <laughs> you should have seen my life when it was all up to him. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and that is actually that that kind of sounds like heresy. Um, because you know, they say you have to give up your you have to give your life to, to God wholly. So that might not be that, that might not fit right there. Which is the trouble you run into when you just keep talking like I do. <laughs> you end up saying something that is not right. But it's okay. You know what I'm saying though, right? Sometimes God works best through human hands, right? I can pray for this dog to have a really nice haircut all I want. Pray for God to bless me with the ability to do it. But unless I actually put in the time and effort and continually practice, trying to get better and improve, then it doesn't matter how much I you know, pray and believe in God. I have to put in the time and effort so that I have a reason to believe in myself. There we go. So what I'm trying to do is just get as much of it even as possible. So it's a nice round head. And also the ears, if you notice, I, I'm treating the ears as part of the head. And that way, you scissor the ears nice and round into the head. So it's a nice round circle, like that. All right. So now, I've got basically the shape I want. I can always perfect it in a little bit. Because I can literally get stuck here. And I'll find myself here tomorrow morning you know, <laughs> still snipping, snipping away. So I'm just going to move on, make myself move on, right? Because just before I finish and let her down off the table, I can go through and just kind of, you know, really perfect everything before I let her down. So I want to look at it from every angle. go. But isn't that story beautiful, the acres of diamond? I really like that because, you know, especially when you're a content creator, you know, sometimes it's easy to look at other people's um, content, look at their videos, look at their posts, and you see like thousands of, inner, you know, comments and likes and it's like, wow, <laughs> you know, people really must like them because I don't know what it feels like to have thousands and thousands. Oh, I, I do now. But anyways, um, not on every post though, you know, some people have like such a strong following, um, which is awesome, you know, of course. But it's like every time they post something, it's like immediately thousands and thousands of views and likes and follow, you know, it's like, wow, it's easy to think, what am I doing wrong? And the answer is nothing, you know? <laughs> the answer is that's their land, that's their farm. And this is mine. It doesn't matter how well their farm's doing. You know, I need my farm to do well for me. 
So that's it, it, I realize it's 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 like trying to take someone else's blessing. It's not going to work because that blessing wasn't meant for you. You know, that's their blessing. And to try to take someone else's blessing, first of all, it's not going to work. And even if it did, you're not really going to enjoy it because it wasn't meant for you. It wasn't, it wasn't made for you. You know, just like a Bijan trim is made for a Bijan. If I try to do this trim on a Shizu, it's not going to look right because it's not made, it's not meant for a Shizu. So I realized, you know, to try to take someone else's blessing is, is to try to, <clears throat> it's like trying to take medication that's meant for someone else. My brother, I walked downstairs the other morning and he had a big bag of medication. I mean, I, I couldn't even count how many bottles of medication he had, prescription pills. I mean, because he has high blood pressure, he has diabetes, he has, you know, a new kidney that he just got. So he's, he's on all kinds of medication. That medication, all of it is meant for him, right? So what if I got the idea, oh my goodness, that medication is keeping him alive, you know? And he's, he's a mess, his body's a wreck. And that medication is helping him stay alive. I'm healthy. Imagine what it would do for me if I take it, you know? Maybe it'll turn me into a super soldier like Captain America and I take all his medication. I might die because it would cause complications in my system because that medication was not meant for me. So even though it's helpful for him, it might destroy me because it's not meant for me. Same thing with trying to work someone else's land or being jealous of someone else's blessing. That blessing may seem, may help that person and may be wonderful for them. And you know, you might even recognize, wow, it's doing wonderful things for them. I want that blessing too, but without knowing that person's, you know, full situation, we don't know what everyone's going through. You may not realize that getting the same blessing might actually destroy you, even though it's helping them. Just like trying to take someone else's medication because you see it's helping them. You see what I mean? <clears throat> <laughs> There's a funny joke I heard, I read in the Reader's Digest <laughs> while standing in line at Publix one day. Um, so the joke is a farmer calls his vet and tells him, man, my bull, I guess he's getting old or something, but he won't touch my cows. He shows no interest in them. What do I do? And the vet, he gives him a bottle of pills and he says, go ahead and give him one of these every day. And he should be, he should be fine. And about a week later, his, his friend stops by to check in on him. He says, hey, how's that, how's that bull, old bull of yours doing? You know, that medication work? He says, yeah, oh my God, it's like a miracle. My, he's out there, you know, <laughs> banging all the chicks. Anyways, he's out there, you know, like getting all my cows pregnant. Like, oh my God, it's amazing. And his friend says, oh, really? That's incredible. He's like, what's it called? What kind of what kind of medication is it? And the farmer says, "I'm not sure. I don't know, but it tastes like licorice." <laughs> but anyways, uh, obviously it's a joke because if you did take a medication that was made for a bull, right, to get his testosterone back and kicking and stuff, I'm pretty sure if an old man took it it probably might kill him, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Cause his heart to burst or something. I don't know, but I'm just saying like, it's probably not a good idea to take a uh, medication that was meant for a giant bull, you know, or a horse. Um, but yeah, where I'm going with that is, <laughs> don't compare yourself to others. You know, don't wish that you had what they had. You know, there's no, there's no reason to because you're not them, you know, and that's not your land. You've been given your own land. You might ask yourself, what is my land? Well, if you're a housewife and you're taking care of your children to the best of your ability, that's your land. You know, if you're working at a convenience store and the people in the neighborhood trust you and they get to know you and they see how helpful you are every time you come in, you learn their names, you ask about their day, that's your land. Your land is whatever responsibility 
or task that is given to you. That's your land. So you work your land to the best of your ability, whether it's being a mother, you know, being a father, you know, being a teacher, whatever your land is, wherever you find yourself, be there and work it to the best of your ability. And that way, just like that pastor driving, you know, riding down the countryside when he says, hey, your land is so beautiful. You must be so lucky. You can say, yeah, I probably am lucky, you know, but luck seems to come to those who work for it, you know? Okay. There we go. So like I said, I'm going to smooth out all these hairs that kind of stick out. There we go. See, the shape is starting to come together nicely. Oh, wow. Okay, let me catch up. Anne says, hi there. He's, oh, yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, too. <laughs> what a good Bijan baby. Yeah, she is. <clears throat> okay. I remember <laughs> um, I was telling the story of King David and Bathsheba and, you know, getting into the Bible a little bit. Because um, I grew up studying all those Bible stories and everything. Um, somebody was saying, like, could you just stop preaching? <laughs> like, could you just groom and, and, you know, keep it to grooming? But again, um, this is my land. <laughs> this is me, you know? And it's like, yeah, I guess uh, people do come to learn how to groom their own dogs, you know, get grooming tips and things like that. But... If you're gonna watch it for free from me, you're gonna have to put up with a little bit of philosophy. <laughs> you're gonna have to put up with a little bit of uh, my preaching, I guess. And I don't mean to preach. You know, I'm just really just sharing ideas that were helpful to me. But I can see how I can come across as preachy, and I am working on that. I'm trying not to come across, you know, that way. There we go. So the back legs. So the feet like to start on the bottom and work up. Just like brushing, you know, you start from the bottom and you brush up. I like to trim the bottom of the feet, get it really nice and tight, and then work up. Sorry, I was concentrating. I almost forgot where I was. I thought I was on Mars. Okay. There we go. I remember when I was a kid, I'm not sure if there's a saying anymore, but when I was a kid, there was a saying that boys go to Jupiter to get more stupider and girls come from Mars to become superstars. And I thought, how convenient. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true, you know, shoot. I don't, I don't even know how to get to Jupiter. You know what I'm saying? Nobody's been to Jupiter that we know of. So... I don't even like that. I don't even know how that makes any sense. You know what I'm saying? Shoot. I just get in my car and I go home and I get stupider. I don't have to go to another planet, you know? Shoot. Anyways. <laughs> just have a conversation with me for an hour or two and you will feel stupider. So there's no point. You don't have to go to Jupiter to get stupider. Just come to my channel. Hang out for a little bit. But anyways, I don't understand why it's always girls that have to be superstars, you know, stuff like that. And then what do they say? Um, like, <laughs> girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice or something like that. And boys are made of, uh... <laughs> you know what though? I do think it's kind of true though. I always tell my daughters that I'm so happy I have two daughters because I can actually have intelligent conversations with them. <laughs> You know, and I'm not saying that I, I wouldn't be able to have intelligent conversations with boys. I would just have to wait 30 years, you know, until they can actually hold a thought worth even considering, you know, entertaining. So that's the only problem with boys. You have to wait so long before you can actually even have a conversation with them. You know, you got to wait till about 30 years old. And even then, it's questionable. But with my daughters, shoot. Even at 12 years old, she's like kind of correcting me 
and engaging me in philosophical conversation. You know, like, wow, shoot. But I think with boys, you know, what are we gonna talk about? Socks, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> maybe I'm just maybe I'm just biased because I have two daughters. But honestly, um, most of the most like the most meaningful conversations I've ever had have always been with females. Rarely do I ever have a conversation with a male where I walk away feeling like, oh wow, you know, that was really enlightening. I really learned I I got a lot out of that. Rarely does that happen with males. But with the female, I mean I could be having a conversation with you know, my server at Waffle House and feel like I have a meaningful conversation. You know, like, I don't know, it's just something about women. They just seem more considerate of all things. You know, men just seem more um, single-minded, you know, I guess. I guess it's kind of a good thing. You know, you set a man on a task, you know, it's like, hey, build us a shelter. It's like, okay, you know, and that's it. And he will, he'll spend all day just working on that and he'll build you a shelter. Because that's basically what we're good for. <laughs> it's, it's good stuff. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so I guess, you know, men are, but, and I take that back. Because there are people like Sam Harris, you know, Neil Tyson DeGrasse. There are very brilliant men. And Jim Rohn, people that I learned, Simon Sinek, Seth Godin. But, you know, these are famous people who written books, Dr. Wayne Dyer. And how often do I get a chance to sit down with these brilliant minds, you know, because they're all famous. But I'm telling you, just day-to-day -day interactions, I mean, I, when I sit down with the female, even if it's at a coffee shop and we have a conversation, I feel, I feel like I learned some, I feel like I, I'm taking away something, you know, but I, you know, I got something valuable out of the conversation. But with men, sometimes it's just all about, you know, tits and boobs and oh, this and that and, you know. And that's cool every once in a while, but I've never really been into that. Maybe because I respect my mother so much um, growing up. And I'm not saying that all guys who are crude don't respect their moms. I'm just saying that me personally, ah, watching my mom struggle as a kid, I always wanted to help her. You know, I would work around the house, try to keep it clean, try to cook and make rice and things like that. So she didn't really have to because I saw how hard she was working all the time. And then I would see my dad, you know, mistreat her. And we, my mom and I would have conversations, you know, long conversations. And I just, I don't know. Even, that's why when mama jokes came out even, um, several people came within an inch of their lives because of mama jokes. I couldn't stand it. I remember this one kid, he made fun of me every day in art class. Every day he would make fun of me. And the kids would laugh, you know, and I just ignored it. And I would feel like crying, you know, because I would get so angry and upset and things that, not even, it wasn't even the things that he said, it was more the reaction of all of the other kids, you know, that just everybody laughing at me. And I remember like just whatever, you know, I didn't want to start trouble. I didn't want to hit, you know, fight or, I didn't want to be a bad kid, so I just let it go. But then, one day he pushed it too far. He told me, he was like, "Hey June, um, I was at the I was at the market the other day, and I saw your mom. She had a shopping cart cart full of egg rolls, and everyone laughed, and I lost it. I was so upset. I was like, you know, you motherfucker, you can make fun of me all you want. I don't care." Well, I do care, but I'm not going to do anything. But now you've crossed the line. You know, you made fun of my mom. And the thing is, I didn't even get the joke. I still don't get the joke to this day. You know, it's like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, that my mom had a shopping, bar, a shopping cart full of egg rolls. What does that mean? Is that like a sexual thing? You know, like, I don't know. And the thing is... <laughs> It was very possible, you know, she's Asian. It's very possible that she had a shopping cart full of egg rolls, you know what I'm saying? But she actually likes to make the egg rolls homemade. So it's more, more likely that she had the egg roll wraps in her shopping cart, not fully made egg rolls. But anyways, that just set me off. And I chased him down and I punched him in the face. His head hit the wall, the brick wall, 
He fell unconscious at my feet, and I was scared. And I remember feeling so scared, like, did I just kill him? Did I just kill this guy with one hit? And then I got in-school suspension. Oh, here's the cool thing, though. When I got in-school suspension, um, my English teacher, Mr. Thornton, I still remember his name, and I'm not sure if he's still around, but because he was older, but I loved English class. And I think he knew it. He, I mean, he knew, he saw how excited and enthusiastic I was in class. I would love to read passages from, you know, from the reading assignments. Um, I, would, I love literature and I love to write and read and learn about history. And so he really likes me. He took a real liking to me. And this is in Louisville, Kentucky, where racism is real. And I, I, I experienced it. But this man, he did not see an Asian kid he saw a little boy with, who had a fascination for literature and the language arts. And I think, you know, because we shared that same interest, he took a liking to me. And I remember he came down and visited me when I was in, you know, the, the detention room, because I was in, in, in school suspension. He came down to visit me and, you know, he asked if I could come out to the hallway and the teacher running the you know, detention room, obviously let me go out to the hallway to talk to my English teacher. And I remember he looked at me and he said, June, what are you doing here? He goes, you're not, you don't belong here. You're not, you're not like this. And I thought, I told him what happened. And I, I started crying and I told him, like, I didn't want to hit him. You know, I was like, I didn't want to do that. I, I was like, I, every single day, I just, I just would ignore it. I would just leave it alone. I told him sometimes I would cry by myself in the bathroom. Like I did everything I could to avoid fighting him. But I told him like when he made fun of my mom, I snapped. I, 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 had, I, I lost control. But you know, I was like, I'm sorry, you know. And I told him what he said about my mom. And I, expect, <laughs> I kind of expected him to laugh, <clears throat> but he didn't. When I told him what he said about my mom, I saw sadness in his eyes, like a deep understanding of how much that hurt me. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he started crying. <clears throat> he started crying. And I, I don't think there was anything that he could have said that would have touched me more than that. He started crying. This big man that was intimidating. I mean, he was big and intimidating. A lot of kids were intimidated by him because he was, he had this booming voice, deep, a loud voice, Mr. Thornton. But to see this giant man just break down and cry like that with his hand on my shoulder, it meant so much to me to know that someone cared. So I, you know, I've always wanted to be that, that kind of person, that kind of influence in someone else's life. But yeah, it's like, wow, I remember that. I remember that whole thing. It's like, for me, like, I don't know, you can, you can, you can do whatever you want to me. And I'm usually, I'm usually okay. And I'll, I'll take a deep breath and I'll let it go. But the moment I feel like somebody's taking a stab at, you know, someone I care about, my family, then, then it's on, you know, I see red and nothing else matters. But, you know, that compassion, I think it's that, that, that compassion, that love, love changes people. And had Mr. Thornton not come down and showed me that kindness and showed me that he still believes in me, I'm not sure how my life would have went because I remember thinking in that, that detention room and, and kids kind of even kind of giving me like a, you know, like a attaboy, you know, like, hey, you know, you're the cool guy that punched that kid in the hallway. You know, I kind of felt myself feeling like, wow, maybe I, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can be the tough guy and just beat everyone up, you know, and nobody's going to mess with me then. I, I, I don't know where my life would have went had he not came that moment. Because when I went, when I sat back in my in, that, in my desk after he 
after he and I shared that beautiful moment together where we connected, our hearts connected, um, after I sat back down, this was in sixth grade, I was in middle school, I remember thinking, I want to be the kind of person that Mr. Thornton sees in me. You know, I don't want to let him down again. Because nobody believed in me, not even my own parents. No one believed in me. Everyone told me that I wasn't good enough, you know, that I'm too short, I'm too fat, I'm too ugly, I can't sing, I can't speak, you know, my voice is always cracking, I can't breathe well because my nose, <clears throat> you know, it's like all my life I felt like I'm just not, I'm just not as good as anybody else, you know, like, but then to have him, Mr. Thornton, when I was in sixth grade, you know, show me that there, there is something special in me. If he sees it, then me. And that was a real life-changing moment. And I think we all have that person, that teacher, that one person in our lives <clears throat> that really did make an effect on us, you know, showed us that we matter. And I think those people, you know, are placed in our lives for a reason. Maybe just to inspire us to be that person for someone else in the future, you know? So I'm always looking for opportunities to pay it forward, to be that source of encouragement, acceptance and understanding for someone, which is why when, <clears throat> when I saw Groomers getting all together and ganging up on Ashley down in um, Orlando, Florida, she goes by Ashley's Pack. And when I saw all the groomers ganging up on her and telling her that she de she deserves to die, stop grooming, all this stuff, I I stood up for her, and I made it very publicly known that I do not support that kind of treatment. And do I agree with the way she grooms? Uh, I wouldn't groom that way, but do I expect her to groom this way, the way I groom? No, because she's an artist too. And I'm not gonna tell her that if she sings rock and roll and I sing country music, that she's wrong. You know, every artist has their own style. Every artist has their own intention and their own unique audience. And so for me, it didn't matter whether or not I agreed with what she did during the groom. What I was standing up for was her right to be treated with respect and dignity, even if you disagree with her. You can do it respectfully. You can do it in a polite way. You don't have to tell them that they deserve to die or that they're ugly or making fun of her dreadlocks because she's white. You know, it's like, who cares? That's what she believes and that's what she's doing. And she, her husband and her, you know, they're, they practice what they preach. You know, that's their lifestyle. That's so. And then when the, everybody started attacking um, my favorite groomer, and again, we don't share the same philosophy as far as how to groom the dogs, but that's okay. We can still respect each other as artists, right? And so that's why I felt so strongly about standing up for them and not allowing groomers to mistreat them like that. You can agree, you can disagree with them, but you cannot call them names like that and threaten their life, you know? What gives you the right to tell someone else that they no longer deserve to groom because they don't groom the way you'd groom, you know? Does Eminem spend any time telling mumble rappers to stop rapping the way they do? Yes, he does. <laughs> but maybe that's not a good experience. Okay, but Eminem, wouldn't spend much time trying to, you know, tell Kid Rock not to, not to make that kind of music, or you know what I'm saying, or, or if, or, or the opposite way, if we tell Eminem, hey, stop, stop rapping, you're white, what are you doing? You know, it's like we don't have the right to tell someone how to express themselves in their art. Okay. Uh, Donut Jones, hey, what's up, Donut Jones? Shan I am says totally stereotyping, stere totally stereotyping in a rude way. 
what a jerk people are so rude sorry that happened no nah, it's cool uh, we need miss we need more mr thornton in this world exactly exactly mr thornton and also in high school it was, it was mr smith he was our high school chaplain and he made a huge difference in my life hey what's up mp <clears throat> But I learned then, sometimes the best thing to say is nothing at all. Sometimes the best thing to do is just put your hand on someone's shoulder and cry with them. Sympathy, empathy, compassion. Because had he told me some philosophical quotes, you know, and June, you might want to read this, you know, take a look at this. I'm not sure if that would have had the same effect. You know, I probably would have been like, uh, all right, cool. Thanks, Mr. Thornton. You know, thanks for stopping by. You know, I'm good. But then nothing would have changed. If anything, I may have gone down the wrong road, you know, thinking, okay, I'm getting, you know, people think I'm cool. All these kids are giving me props. All of a sudden, I'm the cool kid because I just knocked someone out in the hallway and all these kids saw it. And, you know, in high school, how work gets around. All of a sudden, I'm like this, you know, karate kid, this kung fu kid, <laughs> and there's rumors going around about me now, and people are kind of respecting me a little bit, they're not making fun of me anymore, you know, I kind of felt good, I kind of felt like, okay, next person that messes with me, same thing, I'm going to knock their ass out too, you know, but then when Mr. Thornton came, and he said, June, what are you doing here? This isn't, this isn't you. You don't belong here. Like, this isn't where you're supposed to be. Like, what happened? And then I told him what happened, and he cried. And he showed me how much he cared about me. That changed me. In that moment, I decided I want to be like Mr. Thornton. I hope he's still alive. Maybe I should look him up. Now that I'm talking about him, maybe I should look him up and see if he is still around. Because if he is, maybe I'll pay him a visit up in Louisville. And I'll tell him, Mr. Thornton, you won't believe what's happened to me <laughs> since sixth grade. People have emailed me telling me that I, I saved their life. One lady in Scotland, actually, she told me, oh, no, I think it was Ireland. She told me that she was on the verge of suicide until she found my videos and bought my book and read it. And she said she didn't feel so alone. She felt like, it's like I, you know, like I understood her. And she reached out to me and we talked. We became friends on Facebook. And she told me that if it wasn't for me, she would be dead. And I don't know if I deserve that kind of credit. But you know me, I'll take it. <laughs> Deserved or not. You give me a compliment, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna snatch it right out of the air. <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, what a, what a blessing, what a gift to give to me, to tell me that something that I did comforted her enough to where she didn't take her own life, you know, that day. <sighs> wow. You know, it would it would be something special though if I could if I could maybe tell Mr. Thornton. That, that, that one thing that he did had such a ripple effect, you know? Because I, I may not be this, the guy I am now had it not been for him, now that I think about it. So maybe I should, maybe I should, you know, pay tribute to him, you know? Like, actually look him up. I'm, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that this weekend. I'm going to look up Mr. Thornton. He used to, if you guys can help me out, maybe, he was uh, the English teacher in West Creek Middle School in Louisville, Kentucky. <clears throat> so, I mean, if you guys are have, have Google handy or something, maybe you can look up, I don't remember his first name, Mr. Thornton um, in West Creek Middle School, Louisville, Kentucky. If you guys, if anyone finds him, let me know, email me. I would love to go visit him and let him know how much he changed my life that day. Oh my God. There we go. 
And of course here it's supposed to be longer, but you know, they're pet dogs and they drink water and get food in their, you know, air, that area. So, so every, everything is done with the end goal in mind. You know, I want to make sure that she's nice and, you know, cute, fluffy, but also that it will be functional so that as a pet, you know, when she does get her, you know, water, get in the water bowl and eats her food and gets food particles in there, I want it nice and short there so it stays clean. So now that we got basically the shape going, I'm going to just go ahead and finish um, with, I think I'm going to use these thinners and round this out a little bit more. Soften those feet, get it nice and round, and then I'll show you the finished results. <clears throat> All righty. No more questions or comments coming in. So, you know, even my divorce, I think it really helped set me up to be more compassionate, more sensitive to what other people are going through, you know, like, when I was going through the divorce, I was thinking, oh my God, it's oh, my life is over. You know, everything that is meaningful to me is gone now. I lost it. And I was thinking, I'm done, you know? But I realize now it's really humbled me and it's made me more sensitive to others and what they're going through and more understanding now, you know, because I understand in relationships, people may say and do horrible things, but it's because relationships are so complex and complicated, and it doesn't make that person a bad person. You know, like it's made me more understanding because I've been through it now. There we go. And every lost dream. Led me to where you are And others who broke my heart They were like northern stars Leading me on my way Into your loving arms This much I know is true That God blessed the broken road that led me straight to you. Okay. All right, let's do those feet. And we will be done. Nice. All righty. There we go. Comb everything out one more time. And then I'm gonna use the thinners to, you know, create that nice soft round look on her feet. There you go. <clears throat> now she's all comfortable. All of those extra layers of hair are gone. You know, like kind of like taking extra layers of clothes off in the summertime. I'm sure she feels nice and fresh now comfortable so go that would be nice though if I do make Mr. Thornton I'm gonna tell him you know wow show him everything that happened you know tell him about the people who contacted me and told me that I inspired them I'm gonna say, Mr. Thornton, look what we've done. <laughs> look what we've done together. Because even though he didn't actually do it, he kind of did do it through me because he passed on that spirit of compassion to me. And I, I decided I wanted to carry it on. I wanted to be like Mr. Thornton. And if Mr. Thornton is not around anymore, then, you know, maybe by me telling his story, you know, it's like honoring his memory, 
one more time. See that? <clears throat> so just by taking off the little edges with the thin, thinning shears, it makes it look nice and soft and round. See that? Taking the little edges off with the thinners. There we go. Wow, I found a girl for me. Darling, just dive right in. Follow my lead. I found a girl beautiful and sweet. I never knew you were the someone waiting for me. We were just kids when I first groomed you. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. And in your eyes, you're holding mine. Baby, I'm dancing in the dark with you between my arms. Barefoot on the grass, listen to our favorite song. When you said you looked a mess, I whispered underneath my breath. You heard, darling, you look perfect. This foot. There we go. Nice. <clears throat> I don't know why I live my life like it's a musical, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> like I'm on Broadway or something. Just hear songs, songs just pop up in my head. I feel this uncontrollable urge to sing. Hey, Bo. Bo. Messing up my groove over here, buddy. All right. Oh, wait a minute. I, blew, I just blew my nose, so sanitizer. You know what I'm saying? That Corona. Getting real. <laughs> Anyways, coronavirus. Okay, so there we go. And uh, uh, one little thing to mention here: the show bijan, you usually wouldn't bevel the feet like this, make them nice and round. Usually they are like caught. They're supposed to be like columns, you know, straight down. Um, but, like I said, <laughs> it's a pet room and it's more for function over fashion. So, if, if back here, if the back of the foot here was all full and it wasn't round and beveled, then it tends to get dirty and matted and things like that faster. So that's why I like to get the um, feet nice and short and round as possible. Even though that might not be the show standard, you know, if you're competing with the Bijan, um, for for the pet room, this seems to be something that the owners really like. I get it really nice and tight and close, all the way to the nails, and but I still give it a nice little round shape and bevel them. There we go, and so that it looks nice and round. And it stays clean because it's short. All right. There we go. And the tail, I like to leave alone. Natural Bijan tail. There we 
go. Soften that around. you again next time you know what i'm saying on the oh shoot he doesn't care <laughs> all righty hey bo you want a treat So this has been my rendition of a Bijan Frise haircut. It is not show trimmer and it's not a show trim. This is a Bijan trim that has been tailored to fit the needs of this particular client. So it's a modified Bijan trim in order to keep the haircut functional as well as fashionable, right? Because we can't have our girl here not looking fashionable. Miss Nikki here, the original diva. There we go. Right, girl? Oh, can I see your eyes? a little walk around here <coughs> okay oh okay Karen says what a beautiful groom done with love oh thank you uh, she says the dog is loving the singing oh is she <laughs> I thought maybe she was just tolerating it um, doesn't seem to be on faculty anymore but West Creek Middle School has a Facebook page. Maybe put a feeler. Wow, thank you, Shen I am. Seriously. Wow, thank you. I didn't even I did, I did not expect anybody to actually do anything. I just I thought I just thought I'd put it out there. Thank you so much. So they have a Facebook page, West West Creek Middle School. Okay. Um, I may I may do that. Um, Karen says, love the love the feet. Little round feet look so good. That owner's feet. Yeah, right? I love little round feet, right? Oh, do you like it too, Dickie? You like your feet being little round? I might fix the eyes right there. When I see your face, there's not a thing that I would change except for those little hairs sticking out and bothering me. Okay. So Bruno Mars, if you get mad that I changed the words of your song, come at me then, bruh. Come at me then, you know what I'm saying? I'll meet you halfway though, that's all I'm saying. Come at me, it's one thing you can expect. I'm gonna meet you halfway, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There will be some problems. Okay, uh, Catherine says, great job. I have a Bijan and find maintenance a challenge. I do my own grooming, it's not, oh wow, Catherine. Awesome, no, it's Ka Catherine, yeah, Catherine McKinney. Okay, so I saw that there, there we go. And, you know, I like these swivel thumbs. I didn't think I would. I kind of got a little, you know, had, I had to get used to it a little bit. But I kind of like these swivel thumbs, meaning this swivels around. So you can kind of just hold it any kind of way, and it just swivels. See that? I kind of like that. I, it gotta, I had to get used to it. But once I got used to it, I was like, oh, wow. I kind of like this. Nikki, you're so beautiful. Let me go. All righty. 
Wow. Beautiful. <coughs> nice. Okay, now we'll do a walk around. Oh my goodness. Nikki. Wow. Oh, why does that look lopsided? It's okay. All right, maybe just the way she was turning. Okay, so let me see here. All right. Oh man, can you stand up, Nikki? Thank you. Oh, look at that. Oh my goodness. Beautiful, Nikki. Nice. So they're nice and clean and tight, compact. See that? And that way, that ain't this area is gonna stay nice and clean when she poos. Here's will stay nice and clean when she pees. See that? And then the feet are nice and round, even though they're not really supposed to be. So it keeps it nice and you know clean when she runs out in the grass and the you know the morning dew and things like that. Oh my goodness, Nikki! Awesome. You wanna do a little shake? Nothing? No, you're done. She's like, I am ready for my beauty nap. Right, girl? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Beautiful girl. Wow. When I see your face, there's not a thing that I would change. Cause girl, you're amazing. Boop. Just the way you are. <laughs> the way you are. I'm scared. It's like, dude, don't get carried away, right? Sorry about that, guys. Sometimes I get carried away. Music carries me, you know what I'm saying? So anyways, that's that. Oh, nice. Sister Evie, she's like, are you going to sing to me too? So I'm going to groom her tomorrow. Oh, how's your sister look? <laughs> she came and she was like, what is that croaking? Is someone dying? <laughs> Thank you for your concern, Nick. I uh, mean, I'm not dying. That was just me singing. <laughs> Alrighty, uh, she loves it. A little devil. Yes. Oh my goodness, isn't she? So, anyways, thank you guys for watching. I really hope that that was, um, you know, at least a little entertaining. You know, learn a little bit more about me. And Shan, I am seriously. Thank you so much. If Mr. Thornton is no longer with us, then I think I might write a blog about him or something. I, I, you know, I'm really glad I did the stream. Because I haven't thought about Mr. Thornton for a long time now. And just by thinking about him today, I realize I, I need to honor his memory. You know, because that was a man who, who was a hero that no one, no one knew about. And I think it's time that I honor him. So anyways, thanks to Shan I Am. I really appreciate that. Uh, Shannon says, thank you. Good luck to you and your search for Mr. Thornton. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you for pointing me in the right direction. I love that. Thank you.